we're all hoping for some kind of users maybe be, uh, or I mean, we can also be happy just building for other developers, but you know, that will not really scale, um, I guess, the whole crypto technology. Like, we're actually building for end users in the end. And so we're kind of wondering, like, why are there so many chains? Why do we need a drop down of the same application being deployed on uh, yeah, several uh, networks? And so actually, the goal should be like actually remove this drop down from an end-user perspective, even if it's a pro-consumer and like a pro-creator, um, they kind of just are concerned with the best uh, rates. So there's two major problems that we observe at the moment. And one of them is just onboarding users is quite hard, right? So each, I mean, maybe you have a few different wallets and a few different chains already, but essentially every uh, onboarding is also quite different. The wallet interface is different. You might need to on-ramp to a new token um, to pay for gas fees, and each protocol might have like you know different like individual I guess uh, specialties that they um, code in the protocol. So that's kind of hard. Like why would you have to onboard several times? And we can make a chance. Um, let's see if this is working. No? Okay, it's kind of missing. Like we already made a chance in our in our front end to have. Something like a co-pilot to help users actually onboard um, with different um, uh, different like steps. I think this video is not working, but it's okay. Um, and a second. And uh, but the idea is really like actually you just want to be onboarded on board once, right? So like one account. You maybe you're not even concerned with the address that you have, but like. Usually, uh, users are concerned with like having one identity that we can, you know, kind of use on the internet or like use in different applications um, and, and log in. And so, even if you have maybe like, if you think of bank accounts, you might have different accounts, but they're kind of limited, right? And they all have just like one way of onboarding. So, onboarding users is really hard if you have a bunch of different networks to think about. So, the goal should be just to onboard once to use uh, crypto and then uh, use everything else. Uh, the second uh, big problem that we see is kind of this like mercenary uh, moving capital, uh, where we see um, mutual applications that are pretty popular, right? They accumulate a lot of TVL on a certain chain, and then because of its brand or their popular popularity, or I guess also security, uh, they venture to other chains, um, but only like if they're getting paid or it's kind of opportunistic, and. That can create a problem because essentially what they're following is like a multi-chain uh, strategy. So they're deploying the same version um, of their application on different chains. Um, that causes poor maintenance, it causes fractions of liquidity, and also in the end, like a bit more complicated user experience. And so what we propose instead is more of a cross-chain um, DAS strategy where the application really only chooses to deploy on the I guess the core protocol or the VM that's most suitable, suitable for that application. In this case, this would just be like, I mean, it's just one example. We have uh, Ave that could be deployed on several chains, but uh, actually, here on the right hand side of the cross chain DAP strategy, you'd have it only deployed on Ethmos, and then it will still be accessible from other chains. Um, and just a quick outlook like, what would that mean? In the end, it's like this kind of, we call it only liquidity and only NFT. So you could have like stories like, okay, I want to borrow um, uh, without actually knowing from where. So we could say, I want to use Ave to borrow Adam with E. But what you notice here, you don't actually like mention where from, like which network is underlying, right? So it's a different messaging towards the end user um, for. Um, that is only possible with interoperability. In the same way um, for like only NFT, like you can buy basket NFT if you know them with ETH uh, on OpenSea, which is just like a uh, NFT marketplace if you don't know it um, to use it in a game. But we don't really say if it's happening on Ethereum, if it's happening on a coffee chain, and most other. So that's kind of like the future narrative that we see coming up. Um, so that's kind of just from like, a, I guess, uh, more product perspective, now coming a bit more into like how it would possible 
If you haven't heard of uh, the Interlockchain Communication Protocol, as you see, that's basically the uh, standard for connecting, um, you know, basically transferring data between blockchains. And it's been like for like, over two years now, I think, connecting a bunch of chains, and it's been a very like well-proven protocol for connecting blockchains. And uh, yeah, Ada, I think is going to talk a bit more detail about how that works, actually. Thanks, Sam. Yeah, so now I'm going to be uh, talking a little bit more, like, deep diving into the RTC protocol, how it works, and what are we doing on Edmos to leverage this interoperability protocol to make, uh, to create better products um, by abstracting these complexities. Um, basically, offering, like, one single transaction workflows uh, leverage this uh, interoperability from smart contracts also. So the IBC protocol is designed in layers, similar to what the internet uh, protocol works. Um, and it has two main layers. One is the um, transfer layer, which is called here IBC Tau which defines transport, authentication, and forwarding of the data that is transmitted from one chain to another. So, in transport between chains, like, like you know, who's the actor, or who's the, yeah, in this case, the actor involved in the um, verification of proofs of inclusion in each of the chains, the authentication, um, and the ordering of the package. Uh, like, do they need to be sent sequentially, or can be sent asynchronously, uh, no matter who, what package gets sent before or after. And then on top of that, we have the application layer, and the application layer basically defines everything that is um, defined by the chain, uh, like business logic, so to speak. For example, when we are talking about a cross-chain token transfer, that means deducting the balance on, one, on, on the user of one chain, and um, increasing the balance on the user on the other chain, in simple words. But that's sort of like the protocol that defines all the applications that use this transport layer um, to define some business logic. And from a like, more complex point of view, this is what it looks like when we talk about the different layers. So, we have from one side of chain A and the other one's of chain B. Um, so on, on each of these chains, the IPC protocol is implemented. And how it works is that you have, a, just going to skip a little bit, you have this actor called the relayer, the one that is like running on live clients of the two chains in order to verify the state transitions. Um, we're going to take a picture and I'm going to go back before I. So, so there's like the client state that needs to be maintained. So you have like the, basically, when we're talking about interoperability, it's the, the main crucial point is like, how do we prevent double spending? Like the same problem that Bitcoin first addressed, but across the different chains, how do we prevent the double spending? And so for that, the IBC protocol was implemented in a way that you need to have a proof from the other chain, basically you establish a root of trust and you verify that the other chain has indeed um, made the commitment, these proof of ICS 23, that's the standard, for, for the, in the case of a token transfer, deducting the balance of the user that is making the transfer. So that comes, goes on, for example, on chain A, and then you have the likewise that maintain the state, how updated the state is. And the relayer is the one that keeps the file updated by, for example, submitting the latest uh, height and the latest proof from the chain B. So the relayer sends updated client to client to chain A um, to keep it up to date. And same goes for chain B with the updates from um, chain A. So then this way, you can keep the two chains up to date in order to verify the, um, the Merkle rules. Yes. So does that mean that uh, the security of such a Cosmos ecosystem will equate the security of the least secure participating chain? 
uh, because yes. I can always. So you, you're when you're establishing a, and this is where I was going to go next, the connection between the two chains. You're basically establishing a root of trust between the two chains. So if the other chain is malicious, uh, it only affects that chain and that particular chain. Um, you, it doesn't affect the, the entire network. So it's like they, if there's a Byzantine uh, behavior on the protocol, it only affects that chain. So you can also close the channels um, and, and terminate the connection at any point. So, that's so what happens with the NFT? So it comes back from the small chain that no one trusts into Ethereum mainnet, and either it's the Iraq NFT that it's no a one cares NFT. about. It will be a, like it will be a rough thing. Like if you implement the same protocol that we have, and I, we can go on that later when I do the workflow. But basically, um, you would lock the NFT on the malicious chain, and then you will meet a voucher NFT on Ethereum. That's more or less the one. So, um, so okay, we we talk about the proofs that verify the Merkle the the, the Merkle proofs and the clients that basically need to keep outdated in order to verify the proof. Um, the connections that define the, basically this root of trust between the two chains um, that needs to be created with a handshake. The handshake is like, I initiate the connection, then it's like a multi-way handshake. Um, uh, so it's like three steps or so, in order to open a, a connection. And then uh, the same happens with the channels. So channels, as opposed to connections, connections bind the chase itself, and channels bind specific parts of the state. So for example, if you have a smart contract, uh, it binds a smart contract in one chain with a smart contract on another chain, or if we're talking about, for example, Cosmos chains that use modules, or uh, if we think of, of the variable tree, it will only bind one side like one branch of the of the of the tree with another side of the tree on the counterpart on the chain B. So it binds specific part of the state as opposed to the entire chain. Yes. So I am just wondering one and curious what happens if you change the case and let the CIMC protocol handle that appeal. Yes. That's a submit 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 misbehavior. Okay. And, and, and the consequence for that chain is the, the connection is terminated. Is there like a tracking of like how uh, how good a chain has been over time or something like that? Uh, well, there. Well, we, we don't. Know there hasn't been any like, misbehavior on mainnet. Um, right. Uh, on any. It's just a tether incident. Huh? Like a tether incident. Uh, like a tether. Oh, okay. doing our thing. But well, even there are, yeah, yeah. Um, the protocol also works. Fine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The protocol was. Yeah. No. The, in that sense, when, when Terra collapsed, it was not about the IBC protocol itself, but it was like the token was crashing and uh, they closed the channels. Yeah. So that apparently, like, it really uh, that was blowing out the, the chain. Same with Wormhole, that was like connecting Terra with. Um, Ethereum, um, the connection on the work wall was also terminated, or like on the gateway was also closed. Wait, who, who controlled it? On, on IDC? You can close the channel with, uh, um, yeah, you can send a transaction to close the channel. It's like, everything's permissionless. Um, so, okay, we talk about clients, we talk about connections, and we talk about channels that are binding certain specific parts of the state. Uh, and in that, in that way, once you create this channel binding, you can start sending packets. So the key part, and what applications rely on, is sending packets from one chain to another. And the packet defines like the, the channel, basically, oh, I'm a smart contract, on chain A, talking to a smart contract on chain B, basically defining, for example, who's the sender and who's the recipient. Um, and then you define some other logic specifically for um, the packet ordering, um, that's also defined on the channel. Um, then you send the packet over, 
you see the um, you receive the packet and then you abstract that logic that is kind of the only application layer. So we have send packet for sending, receiving packet for how to what to do when once you receive something on the other chain, acknowledgement. So once you receive the packet, you execute some logic. It's, it's successful or it failed, and you send it to send acknowledgement back to chain A. And then we have timeouts. So what happens is like the packet never arrives to chain B. If you log the tokens here, you need to send a timeout back to chain A to unlock the token. So those are the main um, the, the main concepts, and then on top of that, we have the application layer. So now we're going to go through. Uh, specific. So how does it work in, in, in reality is that, so we have like chain A, blockchain A, and blockchain B that have like a module that's uh, again a channel that is connected with a module or another channel in chain B. So this for example can be a smart contract with a smart contract or on the Cosmos side it's just like the band module that handles like the logic between transfers. Etc. So, how this works is imagine um, Dan wants to send me 10 uh, Adam from the Cosmos Hub to Evnos. So, Daniel defines the sender, the recipient, my address, defines the token, and defines the amount. And that is abstracted, packet encoded in the IBC packet, which is sent over to the transport layer. Uh, that emits an event which is picked up by the relayer. Here, Dynos tokens are locked. Dynos tokens are locked because he's sending from the Cosmos Fund, which is a native issuer of that token, to Evnos. So, Dynos tokens are locked. Um, send the packet, which emits an event with a proof, which is picked up by the relayer, which also sends, a, on, which sends another transaction to chain B with that same information, with that same packet. So once it's received on chain B, um, what happens here is that the, it goes from the IBC protocol that understands that there was a channel connecting module or the smart contract A or module here um, with module B. It relays it back to the module. And here, the packet data that was encoded in bytes is decoded where I can clearly see this packet was sent by Daniel, by Daniel's address from the Cosmos Hub, to my address on Hedmos, with one token, or like one of the item tokens, with a specific amount. And that is handled, and I receive the transaction, my balance increases, and then the chain uh, sends the acknowledgement back, so the transaction was successful, and that goes back to the chain. And then after that happens, the um, yeah the, the logic is final. The transaction is finalized. Yes. So what the trust assumption? How instance with respect to reacting to the dynamic message? Like what have, like what are the trust assumptions in the sad scenarios? Like uh, what happens if you have a timeout or a failure? Yeah. Um, the, to the logic is reverted. So here, for example, uh, Dynos tokens were locked. Dynos tokens were locked, and then um, the, the voucher was minted here, which represents like one atom, uh, or one virtual atom, uh, that is minted on my on issue to me. And then if the logic fails for whatever reason, this voucher is never minted or reverted, and then the tokens from Daniel are unlocked and sent back. How? How do they know? It's a time. Who is able to execute the, the logic of each of the applications? So every the, the, the beauty of IBC is that every module or every application that's implemented in the protocol is the one responsible for handling this issue. From a from a Protocol point of view, the only thing that you need to care, the only thing that I see here is that a packet was sent, a packet was received, uh, a timeout happened or a remote happened, and the rest is handled by the application itself on its own. So it, you define it in your own application, and that's why it's so, it, 
and so game changer when we talk when we're talking about connecting the smart contract with smart contract because then we're going to implement uh, functionality like interchange farming, for example, or interchange workloads, where you find okay, I'm going to send one transaction from chain A to chain B. Here we're going to like LP some tokens. We're going to get an LP token, which then we're going to send to another chain. I'm going to lend those tokens and get a third token, and that is going to go back to my address on chain. And that will all be defined by the application layer. But you can create like really complex interactions by leveraging this protocol. So are you fine taking more questions? Yes, yes, yes. So what yeah. prevents me from forging, for instance, a time of packet and then double spending? Uh, you can't. Can. <laughs> you can't. Because you, they, because you need to create the, the, the connection. Of, the, the connection between the two chains is likely that it's already created. But if you're creating a smart contract that is malicious, Who's going to buy it with you? You need to create a kind of channel handshake. So, like the other channel on the other chain needs to trust the logic that you're doing on your own smart phone. I thought the connection was uh, with the real. The, the, the connection is between the two chains, and the channels are between smart contracts or parts of the state. So, so what sections? So of... What does the relay have other than I assume censoring? The... Uh, they can. I mean, there are multiple relayers. Like the likelihood. I mean, if I have seen anything, it's like packet, like so many packets being sent. Like when there's like high transaction volume for bigger chains, that they queue up and they're like stuck for some time. And some of them will time out, and some of them not. But you need to default the 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 queue, so to speak. The, the relay is keeping track of it. Yeah, the relay is very key. So I think the relay is also checking the proofs on your gear chain. Yes. Yeah. That's not a reminder that there's like another software that they run. A malicious relayer, like assuming there's just one relayer, could they then forge a timeout and double spend? Uh, no, because then how would they create a proof? Like they will need to also What's make their own. Sort of like proof. Do we need to force a proof? Which of the same? What, what proof? Um, is that a, uh, a Merkle proof? Inclusion in the blockchain. Oh, but what happens is that assuming. I mean, you, what you can do is amend the the, uh, the new coin. So how can you prove that it was not amended? There's no. Uh, there, there was never. A, then. Okay, so if it ne it's never written, then it will time out because right. the user here on the on the send the token uh, over to me, for example, that and the send me one atom. Um, it never receives like the acknowledgement. Then it's already there to send the acknowledgement back. So they kind of just like they on. they are sometimes that there's only one in there, which is which is like could be, but there's not. Not a single chain that doesn't have a reader because they're also most of the time also validators that are running this because they care about the the interoperability and the centralization because this, they see this as a critical piece of infrastructure for interoperability. Um, and then the other thing, um, what what could happen, for example, is that a relayer deploys a smart contract on on um, one chain. Another chain, and um, they create a connect, uh, channel between them uh, that is malicious, but it's both their own uh, their own application that is two malicious applications connected to each other. So, like, if it's not being used for anything, could they really have sent back a timeout and an acknowledgement? Yeah, but oh, they will execute the first one. Though. The, uh, is received. So what's the worst case scenario? What's the worst that could happen? The worst? Because it sounds too good to be true. <laughs> <laughs> so just one thing that comes to mind, and it's really a question, and I'm, I'm part of the trying to understand. So like, each chain has its own set of logic, right? Yes. Could there be an instance whereby um, you know, the, the, there's there, there's there's there are like storage proofs that stage the chain A will send yeah. the relayer checks, chain B will also send a, a storage proof, but then the validators can do and uh, misbehave. 
the value of the yeah, we are that if the investor gets sent, but then the stake on chain B uh, uh, said it's minted by the Yeah, well, you, so that, that's the misbehavior part. The misbehavior handling is when they, on the full node, you have one proof, but on the likewise, the likewise is getting another proof. So the proofs are conflicting against each other, and then what happens is like, you know, money makes sense and misbehave, the proof for misbehavior. So that would be because you have conflicting proof, and then one of it goes to the chart. No, but I mean, if the validator is then who yeah, have to have yes. the back. So, what you got, you know, if the validator is, is the validator pollute, then your entire chain is far from like it, it has nothing to do with the protocol. That's right, yeah, the protocol. Sure, no, but it has to do with the chain itself, of course. But yeah, that's what I mean. Like, if, if that happens, it's like the chain itself, but not the protocol itself. But it's like, this only defines. But I guess if I'm chain A, then, then what's my decision matrix? And like blacklist that chain maybe or something, I don't know. Yeah, well, then all the products start from the malicious chain on the good chain is one of this, right? So it's like a big deal. Uh, like if you really have the minds, the reasoning behind the interoperability in the first place, we like can acknowledge you, that. Well, what do you mean? You said? Like if the source, train, the source chain becomes malicious, or maybe it's just not secured strongly enough. That that means that the messages that were relayed to main and giving, let's say, all of a sudden are, are no longer to be trusted. So that's a big deal, right? Can I ask again? Though, so, yes, uh, they don't, they hold any kind of money on the chain, not secure. So maybe our thinking should be how it is secure because it's secure now. Uh, uh, just answering your question, is it a malicious network? Then this NFT is what? On this network, this source was transferred. It's working. And you don't know, you don't know. It's, it's malicious. Cool. But you if don't know it's malicious. If it's not, don't, don't, you know or you don't. If, it, if it's on this network, it's working because it's a malicious network. You are transferring worthless NFT to another network. Then it's your problem because. It's worth it. In what this house? That's a that's a key part of IBC. Just like the IBC protocol does not care about what you're building on top of it. It does only care about the uh, connections, the channels, how they're binding, and sending the packet and handling the receipt. Like who I receive a packet, who am I supposed to give it to? Am I going to give it to uh, smart contract A, smart contract B? module, etc. And, and it routes the, the, the packet to that channel and then that that channel with that specific behavior with that specific application logic, that distance logic, um, uh, is able to like handle the content of the payload of, of that packet. So in that sense what you're saying, yeah it's true that you can have two chains binding uh, malicious channels with one another, but then that's, again, not what the IBC protocol cares, but what the like, smart contract behavior is. Like, that's completely, like, we're abstracting the transport, which is the core protocol, from the application, which is what smart contracts or even application-specific blockchain player wants to possible for you. So that, in that sense, yes, you can have malicious behavior, but, but again, that is obstructed from the transport here. Thanks. Do we have a question? Yeah, I mean, so you still have to, uh, you still have to focus on, like, either the applications or the, the contracts uh, to, like, audit them properly. Like, there still is some kind of, I guess, validity and, like, community trust that comes with the yeah, chain protocol. Right. Obviously, so there's standards for yeah, it's a social applications as well. Social application for sure. I mean, in this case, you would have to audit the chain. Exactly. Not, not yeah. just yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. Audit, we have standards for different applications as well. This is a good thing to picture because it's. I mean, this is even outdated. There's like more than sixty chains now um, connected with IBC, right? And obviously, if you're starting a connection um, or channel, um, yeah, you should be. Doing your proper uh, auditing and like you know checking the specification, checking the chain. That's why open source is really important. Um, 
Right. And also the validators that are actually on the network are very important. It's, it's, it's really important that they're, you know, tech savvy as well and know what they're talking about. Yeah. Uh, cool. Yeah, really cool excerpt. Yeah, great. Keep asking questions for sure. Um, so yeah, this is, um, I mean, yeah, we talked a lot about causal chains, right? There's actually also um, some protocols connecting uh, Cosmos chains with uh, non-Cosmos chains, right? Using RBC, like we have Axler, we have Wormhole, we have a bunch of others that are working on this. Um, but yeah, kind of like coming back to uh, the interoperability part, like if you have this established, basically what it means is like if you start a new chain, you can uh, work with the standard you already have access to, you know, the DeFi ecosystem. You don't need to bootstrap uh, liquidity on one chain, um, but rather have maybe different applications that you can access rather than having to deploy them again. Um, same like the liquidity, right? Like if I'm starting my new chain, then I don't know, the, the game or I don't know, NFT marketplace or whatever, um, I can still make sure that I can have access to liquidity on other chains on the DEX. Um, through interoperability, and then coming back also to the initial topic for the UX. Uh, actually, for end users, it's incredibly important to, to keep things simple. TRBC, did you want to mention this as well? Yeah, let's go for it. Cool. Um, yeah, so, one of the main problems of IBC is that right now it's only, for the most part, only connecting the chains with chains, um, layer ones with layer ones. But what happens when you want to start connecting smart contracts to other smart contracts? Um, they, and that's when we wanted to introduce this concept of dynamic IPC. So uh, how do you create an application, um, the IPC application layer, or an IPC app, as you call it, without having to go through a network upgrade or a hard fork. And so what we are introducing is um, these abstractions in the form that is very um, uh, really compatible with what Solidity developers are expecting in the sense of creating an API interface that basically abstracts all of the complexity of like clients connections and channel, and the only thing that you need to do is like sending the packet and handling the packet. That means uh, what, what you do when you receive a new packet data with the payload, and what you do when you have like an unacknowledged amount of time. So um, this is, we hope, really going to bootstrap and, and accelerate the innovation and the piece of innovation of interoperable applications that are going to be built using this technology. Um, that is sort of awesome that today for powers more than 60 chains that are alive and many more coming, including DYDIs, etc. Um, so this is for Cosmos, sorry. This is not for Ethereum. This is for, so, okay. so that this is for um, connecting EVM smart contracts to other EVM smart contracts and vice versa. Well, yeah. Um, EVM smart contracts with other EVMs, like Cosmo, Wasm, Solana, EVM, etc. And EVM smart contracts with layer one. So for example, um, I have an ERC-20, I want to send it over to Cosmos that is not EVM compatible. So that, that logic can be handled via the NFC as well. So why do we need Axela and Wormhole and so on? I, I don't know how so like the, the nature, um, and that's the thing, like we, we can have the um, IBC protocol that connects BFP chains for the most part, because we need finality in order to execute the proofs, otherwise uh, you rely on this probabilistic finality, right? Um, or any economic finality as we know in here, or, um, or check or anything. Whatever, you, whatever is your parameter for defining finality, and that's why we call this Euro finality or Ethereum, that it uses an economic consensus, etc. Um, so on, on BFP-based chains, the product, product um, yeah, uh, finality over, over liveness, um, uh, that's 
the IIC protocol is perfect for these use cases. But when you you want to connect, for example, with Ethereum, you need to define like what's the economic finality in the um, And for that, there's teams that are already working on this. For example, uh, Polymer uh, is one team that is building to uh, a lifetime with Ethereum that is IIC compatible, uh, where you can define the, these parameters for security, and you can connect via IDC with change in the Cosmos ecosystem and even the OP, uh, the, the OP Foundation recently released a request for grants for an interoperability protocol between um, OP chains, OP stuff chains, so uh, Base, um, Optimism, Celo, and many others. And so the bridges are just like this. So like what, what can happen and what I would expect in the future if the IDC protocol really takes off is that these protocols would exist on top of IDC. So you can have Wormhole, you can have Axlar, you can have CCRP, TCP, and all these other bridges, bridges technologies that live on top of dynamic IDC or IDC in general. Um, so that the packet data is then sent EVM to any message, like arbitrary message bridges, that we, as we know them today, um, uses under the hood. And so state of the art right now is that they require liquidity provision on both sides. Is that on the right now? That's uh, how the next point. That's you have the liquidity provisions. Most of some of them mint tokens, um, some of them require the liquidity So that's not what we have right now. Um, we're still we're still working on the IDC, but what we actually already have shipped uh, is this thing called EVM extensions. Which, if you're familiar with precompiles in Ethereum, it's actually just a fancy name for it, a more branded name. Um, and we I think released this a couple months ago. And basically, what it allows is you um, like if you don't have EVM extensions, your smart contracts are really containing EVM access data or state, I guess, outside of it. And uh, with the EVM extensions, we basically provide an interface for smart contracts and tap into core protocol functionality. So these are just pre-compiled uh, contracts that like, you can address, that's defined and open for anybody to read. And um, there's specific ones you know, for staking, voting, um, or also IBC, right? So with staking, you can build a bunch of applications like uh, like derivatives, managers, whatever. Uh, from a smart contract level, which is permissionless, which is great on the internet. Uh, or with voting, you can build like sub DAOs or any more, like I guess quadratic funding, or just more, um, you know, exciting, more innovative applications. And uh, also open this up for your community to build on top. So that's really great. And then the IDC part here is, I guess, really important with what we have just discussed for interoperable smart contracts. So this is good. IBC EVM extension allows smart contracts to actually send uh, like transfer packets, any kind of um, packets with them. And I guess IBC would be able to define your uh, custom packet, right? And send it to any other IBC and it will check it. Even the channels and the uh, connections are there. And so uh, what is actually really possible right now is uh, a few of use cases that, that we've implemented. So if you're not available, familiar with uh, Stride, it's a liquid staking chain, Zone. Um, and uh, they basically allow you to you know, like send over your token from uh, Atmos, like as a user, you can send it over to Stride, then uh, perform a liquid staking transaction, and then send over the liquid staked uh, token back to Atmos, and for any other chain, you use it in DeFi. So the idea is you still make, obviously, uh, you benefit from the state of rewards, but you can also use the, um, the liquid token and, and you know, more protocols. So the idea here is now, though, that with the EVM extension, this is available from a smart contract level, right? And actually, this also all happens with one transaction. So you only need to be connected to one network, which in this case would be Atmos. So um, and actually, the huge step towards, I guess, the usability um, as well as like the, the composability that you can have on top of these uh, app chain specific services, right? Like Stride is a chain that not only allows uh, 
is being the animals, but also a bunch of other uh, tokens like Adam, uh, Cosmo, Viper, um, and it's based on their governance. So this means they can build a own protocol. In this case, it's built on top of the Cosmos SDK with like unique protocol um, characteristics, but it's still with like the, I guess, this wrapper of like animals on top would be like smart contracts can really build on top of this service. Um, so this functionality basically allows us to uh, reduce from three or four, even four transactions to one single transaction. So for example, here, in order to liquid stake from Edmos with different uh, liquid staking functionality from Stripe, uh, traditionally a user would send a transaction, a uh, cross-chain transaction to Stripe, it gets received, then sends an, a second transaction here to liquid stake. Um, and then the third transaction that they would send is sending this liquid staking tokens back to the region in chain. So those are three transactions, and potentially four if they didn't have the B token, the gas token here. So or three or potentially four transactions go down to one. So, so you can have all this in one packet? Is that really worth it? Or is it like just one, one call, one transaction with a bunch of different packets? So what happens is like you actually uh, send one packet with a memo in this case, and this memo uh, contains basically a lot of all the information that needs to be uh, parsed on the uh, Stripe zone. They have a middleware for this, and then it basically recognizes, oh, this is like a liquid state call that's cross chain. Um, call the uh, liquid state message and send back the uh, user token um, to, to the to the to um, the defined address that was in the memo in the first place. We have a similar example um, coming up here with Osmosis. Um, okay, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, wait, does, does that make sense? Yeah. Um, I mean, the cool thing here is also like you can also use the entire EVM tooling, right? You could have, I mean, on Atmos, for example, we have uh, the safe, like most of the safe, um, multi stage, right? So uh, if you're familiar to know with that, or if you require this kind of workflow, like this possibility, like, first of all, you have that some of these support for multi stage, like the safe on Stripe chain or any other, but uh, actually, like this is already a given, and that you can basically use the Stripe service with all the tooling and, and support that you already have from the EVM. Um, and then for, I guess, the user perspective, like this is actually the Stripe website. Like usually you're connected to the Stripe chain, but here you only have to be connected to Ethmos. Do one uh, click transaction and uh, it'll do the whole um, um, process of sending over the token, they could stay again and sending it back. And um, we also have a dashboard and this could be, you know, kind of, we're getting to this, this place where like, like I said in the beginning, you only want to be onboarded once to, to a chain or to a network, I guess, and then be able to still use a bunch of services without knowing where to deploy it. And so this is something that's also going to come up. We're going to try out offering like widgets um, for you know the existing community to, uh, to easily perform these transactions. And uh, yeah, second um, uh, example I want to give is uh, osmosis. So like we want to actually perform cross-chain uh, transfer uh, to swap Ethmos or uh, Osmo tokens using the osmosis dex. This is a tweet from Vlad, who's also here in this room, so I hope that this is done work. <laughs> now, we'll try this on, on Maynard, and this is also the part where you can um, uh, also uh, yeah, take part, and, and I'm going to run through it once, perform the transaction, and uh, then if you want, so we can repeat that with, like, if you, if you have your own laptop with you. Um, but what basically happens here is, like, you're connected to the Atmos network, you send the EVM transaction to, um, we call it like a Osmosis outpost, which is a smart contract. Um, you can also admit this, um, kind of omit this, but having like an outpost contract is, is kind of better for the usability because basically it defines all the, um, the memo and like the data that you want to uh, send the EVM extension. Um, so it's an easier interface for smart contract developers to interact with. And what that would then do is, for example, uh, send like an animal token over on the osmosis chain. It would parse this animal, um, perform a, um, 
this one on the net. And then in this case, we have a cannon, or I guess we could also swap for a Cosmo, and then send back that Cosmo token to IBC transfer. Um, same way, I think this is also still a bit blocked, but um, currently there's no, um, I think the IBC load team is working on a standard to send two tokens at the same time to IBC. There's currently no packet standard for this, but as soon as that's live, we will also be able to basically provide liquidity across the chain. Okay. So let's try this out. Um, basically, what we're going to do is uh, just check out this this contract and uh, to form a, um, yeah, basically a IBC transfer from the smart contract uh, that will send over an FMOS token from the FMOS mainnet to Osmosis chain. They're going to do the swap from FMOS to Osmo and we'll send back the Osmo token to the sender at the on, on the FMOS. Um, and so the way that this works is we have yeah, deployed this, or we've set up this uh, outputs contract and uh, basically, we just have like one uh, one transaction called Osmosis Swap, um, which has a approval, um, so that like the smart contract is actually um, has the authority to like actually uh, use or send these tokens from a user perspective. And then what it's going to do is it's going to um, use the transfer message from this ICS20 contract, and the ICS20 is just the name for the um, like normal transfer packet. So that's the standard that's. Uh, has been defined uh, by the ISP protocol. And basically all, the, all you have to uh, enter, or all the parameters you have to provide, is the amount of tokens, the base down, down that you're sending over the output, um, which will be the Osmo token, and then the receiver of, um, you know, who actually wants to receive back the Osmo token. Um, so what we're gonna do basically is, um, uh, maybe also to mention, it um, implements this uh, ICS20 um, interface, which is the um, extension that I mentioned earlier, and uh, also has some types. Um, but basically, if you go to the transfer, um, you'll see like it actually just gives you the interface, right? You have the input data and the expected return. Um, but what actually happens, or where this is executed, is on the core protocol and go. Um, so what we're going to do is select the um, outputs contract, make sure we have the uh, right compiler, compile the contract, and then um, I guess we can actually deploy it uh, in a new way. Um, so make sure we're connected to MetaMask, um, to the Atmos mainnet, and then deploy this contract. So we see the, it's a bit too small, but uh, we see the, the contract was actually deployed. You can also check on the uh, Block Explorer if this happens. Um, so we'll have the um, like new smart contract address, which also, I mean, I guess you could verify it, but. Um, like in the Block Explorer, but it's also going to be already loaded in, into Linux. And so basically, now that we've deployed uh, the outpost contract on the Atmos mainnet, we can already um, perform this cross chain swap. Um, so let's see how much we actually want to send over. Let's say like two Atmos. Um, so this is the vector 
so I think the next one I will find you, but I want to make sure. And so maybe to also check um, the current balance. So this is one of our dashboards, and uh, let me just connect with my address. So currently we have like 30 here and uh, 10 alcohol tokens, about 10.5, I guess. Um, this is a bit bigger. And um, let's do it on the front end actually. Why are you laughing? It should work, yeah. It should last a while. So, so the internet question. Uh, okay, cool. Nice. So we actually um, so basically what we did is we um, initiated or we, we um, interacted with the smart contract deployed at Atmos. Uh, that then send this IBC transfer with a certain metal. Um, actually, I didn't show this, but the uh, metal composition is basically hard coded here, right? So this is the makes it a bit easier um, for the smart contract developer. That's what I mentioned earlier for this blog post. So in this metal, you have like the specific destination contract on the osmosis chain, and any other like. Uh, information they need to understand that this is going to be as well on osmosis, and I want to send it back to Atmos. So if I look here, um, I guess we can actually go into the um, block explorer. So if we look at the latest um, contract interaction um, on eScan, then uh, what we'll see is we actually interact with the contract, right? This is also called the ERP. Um, the transfer module, um, which is like the IBC transfer, you can also look into the logs. Um, I already mentioned it's going to uh, perform authorization first, and then the IBC transfer, so all of this is already uh, also emitted in EVM logs. And, uh, um, you know, we also see that we spent uh, like the two Atmos. And if we go back to um, the balances, we also see actually we performed the swap. So we had 30 before, um, and we now have 11.1 also, which is obviously dependent on the uh, current you know, fixed price or swap price, exactly. Uh, we can also verify this um, even more. So if I go to uh, any tabs, if I go to my home address, you want to see is like the incoming IBC transfer of the Osmo token. Um, so I can go to the Cosmos transaction, and we see like a minute ago there was an IBC receive transfer, um, which should include uh, the Osmo token. Um, right? Uh, 0 0.5. Yeah, 0.5, exactly. So um, this is pretty cool. We can try it on mainnet. And um, yeah, if you want, First of all, any questions for this? Like what we do? Yes. Uh, so I'm curious, maybe this is more like back to the IBC protocol stuff, but like how are, how is execution cost calculated? Like how does, how are fees calculated? I mean, so the fees are paid in this case, yeah. you know, uh, in Atmos. Um, and the we compile it, you can, um, you know, like define, like how much, um, how much cost or how many fees are actually accumulated. So that's, I guess, customizable by, by the protocol and can also be upgraded if we have a core protocol upgrade. I don't think it's a parameter yet, but you could also say, okay, this is a governance parameter that anybody can suggest. Yeah, I don't know how we, um, we have been having a lot of bytes right now, I think. Yeah, so the base guess is just um, the length of the input byte time a flat uh, constant. It's all constant. Yeah. yeah, so that's the minimum we would need. But then the guess estimation happens depending on how obviously how much logic you have in the function. Uh, right. So there's some right that I think some that's the one we're talking Yeah. Yeah, so it's in the what about X like XCM stuff? It's really hard to estimate execution time. So this is just a challenge that they can over up if that exists. To accurately execution if that accurately measure. You're always doing the worst case scenario. Um, you know what I mean? And it sounds like that's pretty much the same here, right? It's not worst, yeah, pretty much. Worst case. Yeah, I think so. Worst case. 
It depends, I guess, on other factors like uh, the fee market and how much you need, or how much, I guess, is congested the network at the time, but, right. yeah. The follow-up question I have is that what happens if the transaction gets rolled back, uh, right? So, like, time, time out, time out better, uh, and, uh, and how does, so if execution was already done on, on the receiving chain, and how does, like, reverse itself? Yeah. Curious about in this how case, that works. So, so in this case, uh, we're only interfacing with the contract once. Um, the contracts, basically you as a user clicks to the bottom, uh, the small contract sends the transaction with the instruction to swap, but then the contract does not handle anything related to the, when you receive the acknowledgement, etc. That's what dynamic IVC is going to be. Um, we're going to be like handling the receiving logic and the timeout logic. Um, the acknowledgement. So, so I'm here right now. It's like if you send it the packet, you you mint, sorry, you lock the token. Um, you send the packet over. It's successful or failure. If it fails, then you unfreeze the token. But the contract itself, the contract that Daniel just interrupted with, uh, does not handle that failure. It's, that's that's not natively by by the protocol. But I, the ideal case scenario is that the contract. Can, the contract is more right, the standards. I know, exactly. For example. Also, yeah, I have a small question. Can you use the word contract to send funds from another one? For example, the same number that the book for the submission to the book, or you need to send funds from the same number? And for example, you have another wallet, and you send another amount of uh, evidence will be just like a breach. So, but you interact with the contract to send another wallet tokens? I mean, for that, you have uh, authorizations um, that you can implement. And that's dependent on the smart contract logic, right? So, you could build uh, an app that, I don't know, it's like a manager, right? And if you, um, I don't know, whitelisted certain, certain other addresses and then give the approval, then yeah, from a smart contract, you could spend another wallet's. Uh, so it's just like a deck that you sign out of the rest, so you can put this smart contract, which is like sort of deck to move on. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it always depends on the, on the authorization that um, a wallet gives to a smart contract. If there's no authorization to the smart contract, then a uh, uh, contract won't be able to spend that wallet's focus. Okay. But it depends on the uh, uh, contract developer to implement the logic. Sorry. <laughs> no, yeah, um, what I was, I was going to add is that now was an EOA interacting with a smart contract, but the, but the whole case of all this is that now smart contracts can talk to these like interoperability uh, outposts to get liquidity outside of the chain. So that's you know, an innovative uh, thing about this uh, outpost model and the extensions. So that, for example, you can have a portfolio manager that, for example, um, deposits some liquidity on another chain or creates a, or liquid stakes some tokens and get the liquid token back and then provide liquidity on, on the same chain, like in this case, Edmos or somewhere else, and so on and so forth. So like you, the, the possibilities to compose are endless with this architecture. Uh, and that's why it's, uh, it's really interesting for for these like, new use cases. So just to revisit the like IBC protocol logic. Yeah. Um, so in the case where you get a timeout and then the transaction on the remote chain succeeds, you've unlocked those tokens and they've also sent you the result. Mm, well. um, you won't get a timeout. Um, like what if the receiving blockchain is slow, right? So if it's received on the, so the, if the token is successful on the other chain, it will automatically send the acknowledgement. So the, the acknowledgement is part of the logic. Yeah. So it's not that someone else needs to send the acknowledgement that is observing the chain and then, oh, I'm gonna send that acknowledgement back. It's automatically sent by the protocol back to the original chain. Uh, so it's like, happens atomically as you finalize the logic on the, on, on the receiving chain. Okay. So like, I guess, I guess you can't have an acknowledgement and a time log at the same time. 
Yeah, but could you have an acknowledgement after a timeout? Yeah, but then the timer will, would already have been processed on the acknowledgement handling. Like, like you will try to send the acknowledgement with the success or, or the failure, and you'll say, oh, this already timeout, so I already handled the timeout. Mm -hmm. Right. And so it will drop a, it will drop a acknowledgement like an, on this message. Yeah, and would the, I guess, how would you reverse the transaction on the remote chain? Um, is that succeeded, right? It's not it depends on the acknowledgement or the timeout. So the timeout, the acknowledgement failure is the same uh, case as the acknowledgement uh, as a timeout, which is a failure case. Yeah. So for example, Daniel transfer wants to transfer for me some auto to Atmos. So Daniel first wants the tokens as part of the protocol. He doesn't know that he's logging the tokens. That's that's it. Part of the application itself, so it logs the tokens, then I get some vouchers that are minted. But if the packet timeouts, then um, the timeout is received on the on the Cosmos phone, and then the tokens are unlocked. But if, if someone or relayer by mistake sends back a um, uh, failure acknowledgement, it would say, "Oh, I already processed this packet because it passed that sequence." We saw it before, but the, whenever you send a um, um, a packet over, it has a sequence number, and I would say, I, I already processed this packet with a sequence. So, like anything that you send afterwards would fail because it's already handled. I think the thing where it becomes complicated then is like when you do these cross chain transfers, you actually have two IOC transactions, right? So, the one first actually has to succeed for the second one to be initiated. So, the first one is timing out for it on acknowledge, uh, there won't be any um, actually swapping or, or sending back the token. But hopefully it's something like that. Yeah. But yeah, of course, like the, um, the logic that's happening here in this case on the Smosky side like, needs to um, set, I guess, the cases in which the initial um, transaction might time out or um, um, fail. Right? So I don't know. I don't know if the, the address of the contract is, is uh, not uh, correct or something like this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, are you guys interested in actually running through this yourself, um, deploying the contract, uh, or will there be enough of a demonstration? Because we still have some time, but. We also have documentation in case you're wrong. Yeah. yeah, what's the best place to like start tinkering with stuff? Um, I mean, we do have, like, I would say like, do this this process. Like, if you want, I can send you some demos right now. Yeah. Um, so we can try this right now. Um, if you um, go to this um, page, we will have some instructions that you can put your address in there, and I can send you some demos. And you'll be able to deploy the contract and um, swap it to us. But yeah, for the people who are like, um, you know, we were just going to run through this, um, so we could be together. Um, if anybody else, like, if you don't want to do this exercise anymore, that basically was the end of it. But also, if you have other questions, feel free to ask. Awesome. I guess like one thing that comes to mind is like, it's just like incredible, incredible that. You could always front run a, 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 a construction, yeah, by by filling up the block such that it'll always time out, or you know by filling up some sort of you know, execution block. Uh, then it's oh, I'm sorry, I'm not understanding what okay, you're so like, filling you know, blocks. Um, well, if there's a if there's a packet that's being sent to to do swap, so okay, yeah. let's just simplify it with one instruction. Um, well, I can I can send. Um, I'm just trying to figure out a maybe. scenario where you front run that. Yeah, like MVV. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but but not, yeah, not not for anything so else other than making sure that it's always in a timeout. What more for sending transfers is not or swapping like just. Yeah, it's not. not I mean, what you can do with what the relayer can do is uh, they go the packet data. So for example, for the swap, they can decode those instructions and say like, oh, there's a 
squad. I'm going to front run them to bigger profits. And then they send, they send one bucket before the action um, to, so then you can get like so many B. And then you get, uh, then they send the other buckets. Um, so that they, the person was originally like, sending it originally would have like all the, like a uh, less favorable swap. Right. Um, and so then like, they try, they trade again after that. But, um, if you can estimate sort of the, 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 the fees associated with the gas execution time associated with the um, and then you just send a bunch of smaller ones, the block producer is probably going to send the smaller ones over the big one. Yeah, the only problem is uh, not any problem. Not uh, any problem. Yeah. have a uh, at the moment, you only have a, a first in, first out mempool. Um, there's also a prioritized mempool, um, like you want on Ethereum, but it's not enabled by default, and so most of the block producers do not use a prioritization. So, uh, the NDV on Cosmos is still fairly small. Yeah. I think if you also especially talk to the Scoop team, um, they've done some great analysis already, but the amount of maybe is still very small. But you know, this could be, um, you know, there's a probability or like using a receipt from this one gets spending with like block building and so on. Great workshop, guys. Cheers. Yeah. Thanks for the questions. So, yeah, do you, you want to run for this? I see like a few people like that, but yeah, we can do it quickly. So, then at least you can run run on with some free Atmos and then do it. Um, so here on the um, okay, here on the documents, and then this part. Have you guys set up that map? Yeah, I um, So basically, if you don't, if you haven't set up that or you're doing it for the first time, you can uh, use our documentation here and then click on connect to my net. And then I'd probably choose like one of the RPC endpoints that are down here that are green. So um, I'm taking the second one, for example, and the first one. Stefan, have you set it up? I have it. Okay. To confirm, you should be able to like have your account here and then set it up once. And so if you have that, then uh, you should copy your address. And uh, put it into this uh, document here. So I'm going to send you some, some blue token. Uh, interface. 
So you can either call me from here or you go to um, our extension to call. So you will basically just have to like make sure you have the correct uh, file name, so type the also copy this contract for the like I said, the type interface. You'll have the IC20 uh, similarity interface, which again is the standard transfer packet for IBC. This one uh, imports the types, that's why we need it recently. And the third one you can copy um, is the actual output smart pass. Let me know if you guys have trouble doing that. Or it's really Did you did you sign that saying I've done some I've some headphones? I haven't received it. Did you have one on the Yes. I know I'm going to go